There we go. Eventually, the Beagle goes around the southern tip of South America and charts the waters between South America and mainland and this volcanic rocky island called Tierra del Fuego. And sailing around here, the Beagle encountered a group of people in English commonly called the Fuegians. Uh, their word for themselves was Yamana or uh, Yagan. Um, and the Yamana and some related peoples are the southernmost of all Native Americans. Um, you know, you may be familiar with Native Americans in North America, but of course there are lots of South American natives. And the Yamana are the farthest south of them all. And there's actually some backstory here. Remember that this is the Beagle's second voyage out. Remember, the first voyage was disrupted when the captain had shot himself and Fitzroy had tried to finish the job. Well, they'd been in this part of the world at the time, uh, rounding the southern tip of South America. And there's a Fuegian, by the way, uh, very well adapted for living in a rough sub-Antarctic climate. Um, made a living hunting and collecting uh, seafood, a lot of shellfish. And like a lot of hunter-gatherer peoples, they had a very relaxed attitude towards personal property on the grounds that, you know, if you're living a nomadic existence, moving to different hunting grounds, you know, owning more things than you can comfortably carry is just a nuisance. So some Fuegians snuck on board the Beagle one night and stole one of the boats, you know, one of the small boats that the Beagle carried. Well, Fitzroy wanted his boat back, so he kidnapped a Fuegian. He never got his boat, and now there's this Fuegian on board. Uh, so what are you going to do? Fitzroy decided he would bring some Fuegians back to Britain and teach them English, you know, teach them to dress properly and worship the correct God and adopt, you know, British, you know, superior culture. And then he'd bring them back and they would live among their people and teach them how to worship the correct God and wear the correct clothing and, you know, basically live in proper and civilized fashion. So I haven't mentioned this before, uh, but he brought four Fuegians back and they'd been living in London for a couple of years. Uh, one of them, in fact, the, the man who'd started all of this, the Fuegian that he'd kidnapped, uh, whose native name is not recorded, the sailors all called him Boat Memory. Uh, well, unfortunate Boat Memory had died soon after arriving in England. Uh, but the other three were on their way back. Uh, there was a man estimated to be in his 30s, uh, a very tall man, um, and the sailors named him after a church with a tall tower in England, and they called him York Minster. Uh, there was a girl of maybe about 10 named Fuegia Basket, and a boy by the name of Jimmy Button. Uh, this is Jimmy Button before and after he cleaned up. Uh, Jimmy Button's real name was written as Orundelico. Uh, they called him Jimmy Button because Fitzroy had traded him for a pearl button uh, to his mom. His mom traded him away for a button. Yeah, anyway. And the reason I'm even bringing this up is that Darwin they had learned some English. Uh, Fuegia was, was quite good at it. Uh, Jimmy, not quite as well, and York never did say very much. Uh, but they could communicate, and Darwin became friends with them. You know, he liked them. And as he wrote, you know, Jimmy Button was a universal favorite. The expression of his face at once showed his nice disposition. He was merry and often laughed and was remarkably sympathetic with anyone in pain. Uh, Darwin wrote that, you know, he got seasick a lot. And 
you know, as he would be throwing up over the side of the ship, Jimmy Button would come over and pat him on the head and say, poor, poor fellow. And then Jimmy Button would laugh because he didn't understand what seasickness was. Because if you're born to a tribe that goes out on stormy waters in little boats like that, you know, you learn very quickly how not to be seasick. So Jimmy Button was mystified as to why this perfectly normal thing was making his friend throw up over the side, but he was kind about it. And he'd say, poor, poor fellow. And there's the rest of them. There's Fuegia Basket up there at the top left and York Minster down there at the, uh, at the bottom. And I bring this up because as he would later write, the Fuegians rank amongst the lowest barbarians. You know, their culture was so different from the British. You know, they, they lived in, you know, these wigwam type huts and they wore animal skins and they didn't farm and they didn't have any writing and they made their living collecting shellfish. But I was continually struck with surprise how closely the three natives on board HMS Beagle who had lived some years in England and could talk a little English, resembled us in disposition and in most of our mental faculties. Darwin actually got to talk to people who'd grown up in a culture radically different from British culture, the one that Darwin grew up in, and at the time not influenced by it. So he got to talk with these people who were so different and yet found out that their minds were fundamentally the same. They resemble us. These quote, degraded savages might actually be our kind of people deep down once you got the cultural differences out of the way and you know, just got to where you could understand them on a personal basis. Huh, that's important. That will be important in the development of Darwin's thinking. And it is considerably more enlightened than a number of people I could mention at the time. Anyway, they dropped off the Fuegians. They also dropped off a missionary they'd been taking who was going to settle on Tierra del Fuego and teach the, uh, the, the Fuegians uh, Christianity. Uh, they had to pick up the missionary because the Fuegians probably took everything he had and then threatened to kill him. So he ended up, uh, leaving almost as quickly as he came. And the Fuegians immediately shucked their European clothes and went right back to their traditional ways. Uh, so that attempt to Christianize the Fuegians didn't end it in failure, but it's important for what Darwin learned about people. Anyway, they sailed up the coast of Chile and reached a town called Concepcion, uh, which had just been sucked by an enormous earthquake. You can see that Concepcion was pretty well destroyed. That's the ruins of the cathedral up there. And Darwin had been reading Lyle. And Darwin was walking along the beach outside of Concepcion, and he noticed these beds of oysters uh, that had been growing underwater and that now smelled really bad because they were lifted up out of the water. Uh, that earthquake had physically lifted the coastline as much as 10 feet. Earthquakes will do that. That's not that uncommon in big quakes. So he could tell that the land had been shoved upwards by as much as 10 feet. Now think like a Lyellian say every earthquake, which may be big, but it's not a global catastrophe. It's the kind of thing that we can study. Earthquakes do happen. Say every earthquake raises the coastline a few feet, multiply that by lots and lots of time, and you'll get this. Uh, this is a shell bed in Northern Chile. Uh, there's a man up there for scale. He's standing on a rock layer, and that rock layer is made up of millions of seashells, except of course they're not in the sea. You find fossil beds of seashells along the coast as high as 1300 feet. How did they get there? You don't need some kind of global flood that was powerful enough to pick up all of the seashells out of the ocean and throw them up into the Andes Mountains. 
you need earthquakes of a type that we can observe happening today multiplied by lots of time. That's very Lyellian reasoning. And Darwin actually wrote letters to Lyell describing this, and Lyell was very impressed because it seemed to confirm his own ideas. Uh, he actually crossed the Andes from the Pacific side and discovered a petrified forest in the desert uh, in a place in Chile called Agua de la Sorra. Uh, there's a plaque that was put up in 2009 uh, yeah, this is a, a park now, the, the Charles Robert Darwin Petrified Forest. And that's one of the petrified logs right there. It turns out that Darwin took some samples and found out later that the structure of the wood resembled a South American conifer called Araucaria, um, the common name for which is monkey puzzle tree. It's a type of conifer that you only find in uh, South America. It's not native anywhere else. So there's that weird link between fossils and living species again. You find fossil Araucaria in the same places, in the same continent where living Araucaria grows. Makes you wonder why that is. And how did you get trees growing in what's now desert 7,000 feet above sea level? Hmm. Maybe it's got something to do with that uplift of the South American coasts again. Maybe when the trees were growing, the mountains weren't mountains, or at least not nearly that high, but they've been gradually uplifted over all that time. Huh. Worth thinking about. And as he would write, it is hardly possible to doubt that this great elevation has been affected by successive small uprisings, you know, these little risings of the coast, such as that which accompanied or caused the earthquake of this year, and likewise by an insensibly slow rise, which is certainly in progress on some parts of this coast. So very Lyellian there, right? Observable processes multiplied by huge amounts of time, and you can get amazing changes in you know, the features of the earth. Okay, so four years of sailing, the mission's accomplished, everybody is pretty much ready to go home. And so the Beagle leaves South America, crosses the Pacific, goes to Australia, crosses the Indian Ocean, uh, reaches South Africa, goes around South Africa, crosses the Atlantic, stops in Brazil one more time, and makes it back to England in October of 1836. On that way back, they stopped for food and water for five weeks at some islands in the Pacific, sitting right on the equator, um, islands named for the Spanish word for tortoises. These are, of course, the Galapagos Islands. And there's a map of them. They are about 600 miles off of the South American coast. Uh, they are now part of, uh, they're now owned by the country of Ecuador, although I'm not sure if Ecuador existed under that name at the time, uh, but they're now territory of Ecuador. Uh, they're located right on the equator. Um, I don't know if you can see it clearly, but the equator is right there, uh, cutting across. Uh, the largest Galapagos island, Isabella, right there. And then there's a few that are north and, you know, a little bit more that are south. So they're on the equator, but they are not tropical islands filled with palm trees, uh, with lots of waiters to bring you fruity rum drinks and uh, with, you know, paper umbrellas. Uh, there's actually cold water currents that are coming up from the southeast. That's South America in this inset map right there. So there's the South American coast. There's the Galapagos. And the currents are doing this, bringing cold water up the South American coast and across. Uh, so the water is relatively cool. And the islands are also, they also get very dry. As typical for the tropics, there is a wet season and a dry season instead of a summer and a winter. 
And the islands get hammered every time we have an El Nino year, because what El Nino does is weaken uh, the current cycles in the Southern Hemisphere. And that has the effect of socking the Galapagos Islands with terrible drought. They're also volcanic. Uh, there's a satellite picture of the islands and right there on the island of Fernandina, uh, you can actually see from space uh, that smoky stuff right there is actually volcanic ash. Uh, the last major eruption that I found hit in April, 2009 uh, but there's still periodic rumblings. You know, there will be more volcanic eruptions given enough time. Uh, that's some dried lava on uh, one of the islands. Um, very smooth flowing lava that's congealed into place and still has this kind of, you know, ribbony appearance, uh, kind of like, you know, hot fudge poured into a cold pan. And Darwin concluded the Galapagos Islands were relatively quite young. Uh, the few fossils that he found were virtually identical to living species. Uh, the islands are small. They're still being built by volcanic eruptions. Um, given the rate of volcanic eruptions, the islands haven't been around for that long compared to the South American mainland, which has been around for much, much longer. Okay. Now the wildlife on the Galapagos is what's put them on the map as it were. And it includes a lot of unique forms, including Sula nabuxii right here, uh, the blue-footed booby. Uh, I should mention booby was British slang at the time for an idiot. Um, Boobies were considered not to be very intelligent birds, although, you know, who knows? Uh, so, yeah, this is a male uh, showing off his blue feet, uh, which is what males do when uh, they're looking for female company. You know, this is, this is the blue-footed booby equivalent of, you know, you know, asking for her number, is, you know, showing off your blue feet. Now, Sula nabuxii is not unique to the Galapagos. Uh, it's a seabird that can fly for long distances. So you get them, you know, on the coast of South and Central America. But there's a lot of species in the Galapagos that are unique. Uh, there's the Galapagos gull. It resembles other New World gulls but it's different enough that we call it a separate species. This is Leucophaeus phylogenosus, and it's only found in the Galapagos. Uh, Galapagos hawks, same genus as the red-tailed hawk, uh, which you can see around here. Red-tailed hawks are Buteo jamaicensis. This is Buteo galapagoensis. Same genus, but that precise species is only found in the Galapagos Islands and nowhere else in the world. There's like three or four species of mockingbird that are found only on the Galapagos and nowhere else. Uh, the Galapagos has a unique species of penguin. Um, there are penguins up that coast of South America. Darwin had seen them, you know, coming up the coast of Chile. But the Galapagos penguin is only found in the Galapagos. It's the only penguin that just barely dips a toe in the Northern Hemisphere. And it looks like other South American penguins, but in detail, it turns out to be unique to the Galapagos Islands, only found there. Why? Um, Central and South America is gifted with a diverse number of species of iguana. But there's two unique iguana species living in the Galapagos. Uh, not only do they physically not look like other iguanas, they've got this bizarre lifestyle uh, where they'll come out on rocks and bask, you know, to warm up their body temperature. They'll sit there in the sun and then they'll jump off the rocks into the cold ocean water and swim around and stuff their faces with seaweed. And then when they get chilled, they climb back out, out on the rocks, warm up, wash, rinse, and repeat. Uh, 
and that's unique to the Galapagos Islands. I don't, there aren't a whole lot of seagoing lizards. This is one of the few. Uh, you get prickly pear cactus in North and South America, but there's six unique species of prickly pear in the Galapagos, including some species that form trees. What the heck are these guys doing here? Notice the pattern. The Galapagos wildlife is very similar to what you'd find in mainland South America or sometimes North America. And yet when you look at it close up, it turns out to be unique. Why do you get that pattern of similarity and difference? The Galapagos got their name from Geochelone elephantopus, the Galapagos tortoise. Um, now this is the same genus as a tortoise I used to see now again in the Mojave Desert in Southern Nevada and Southeastern California, um, a tortoise called the gopher tortoise. But clearly they're not the same because the gopher tortoise is maybe a foot long tops and the Galapagos tortoises are big enough that you could ride them. Uh, in fact, Darwin tried this. He reported sitting on top of a Galapagos tortoise, uh, mostly to see what would happen. And the tortoise basically just, you know, turned its head around and glared at him and groaned at him. And just sat there and went, <laughs> so you, you don't get very far riding Galapagos tortoises, I'm afraid. Why does this matter? Darwin had dinner with the governor of the Galapagos Islands, this guy who was in charge of a colony of maybe a hundred, you know, castaway sailors and random riffraff. And the Galapagos tortoises are edible, which is also why they're critically endangered now. And the governor just happened to mention, because evidently, because he got really bored and the governor happened to mention that he could tell which island, and in some cases, which part of each island every tortoise had come from simply by looking at the shell. And so Darwin found it was true. Every island, and sometimes this is Isabella, the largest of the islands, and it's made of five major volcanoes stuck together. And Darwin found that every island and every peak had tortoises with consistently different shapes of shells. Uh, Beckai up at the top has a kind of, you know, saddle-shaped extension over the neck the others don't. Vicina is kind of square and Guntheri is kind of round and Vandenbergai has lots of fine lines and Microphyes doesn't and so on. With a little practice, you could easily learn to tell these apart. So we have tortoises living on each one of these volcanoes. Uh, I should mention the craters in the volcanoes are where water tends to collect, um, some of it from morning fog and dew, and some of it from the rainstorms that they do get. Uh, so tortoises like living in these craters because they've got lots of plants they can eat and water they can drink. They don't normally cross from one to the other, you know, because they'd have to cross basically, you know, desert badlands to get there. And so each one of these peaks has an isolated population, and each of those populations has a different shell shape. And so it is with the other tortoises on the other islands. The other really famous Galapagos wildlife is the Galapagos finches, uh, which Darwin collected and taxidermied, uh, thank you, John Edmondstone, but didn't really understand what he had until he got to show his specimens to a British bird specialist named John Gould uh, once he was back in England. There's 14 species of finch in the Galapagos. Finches are seed-eating birds. Um, even if you haven't had ornithology with Dr. McDonald, uh, you know a finch. Uh, cardinals are finches. Uh, you might know purple finches as well if you've done a little birding around here. 
And there's 14 species of finch in the Galapagos. And this is one of them, the small ground finch, Geospeza fuliginosa. Different species are found on different islands, although they do overlap. You don't have species of finch restricted to single islands. But what's more, each species has a distinctive way of life and each is adapted to that way of life. And you can see it in their beaks. The small ground finch, small beak, great for picking up and manipulating small seeds. Right, very, very good with handling small seeds, but can't exert a lot of bite force. Large ground finch, great big beak, not so good for manipulating tiny seeds, but very good at cracking big ones. The cactus finch over here, Geospeza scandens, long, narrow beak, very good if you're making a living hopping around on prickly pear cactus and probing. Uh, for seeds and fruits, right? You want a nice long beak. These are often compared to tools. So the cactus finch has the closest thing to needle nose pliers and the ground finch has something like big, you know, linesman's pliers uh, that can exert more bite force but isn't as good for delicate things. So each finch species has a different diet um, each species shows adaptations to that diet in the beak. They're all finches. They all share a common structure. Uh, they're all roughly the same size, certainly the same organs and things like that. And yet they've got these diverse adaptations to very different lifestyles. Uh, the most obvious places to see those are in beak shapes. So here again, we've got the small beaked ground finch with its little beak. And there's the large beak ground finch with a much bigger beak. Oh, the woodpecker finch, uh, cactus pizza pallida, uh, probes around in rotten wood uh, for insects and uh, is actually a tool user. It will take twigs and use, it, use those to probe in rotting wood, which is what this one is doing in that picture. Although my personal favorite, the vampire finch, has a very sharp beak and specializes in hopping up to nesting seabirds and pecking them in the butts and drinking their blood, which reminds me of a dean we used to have in this college. Uh, he was also prone to sneak up from, your beh from behind and stab you and drink your blood. <sighs> Never mind, water under the bridge. But yeah, all these finches are adapted to different ways of life. What are they doing only in the Galapagos? They're similar to finches called grassquits that you could find on the South American mainland, and yet they're not the same. Why are they different? As Darwin wrote, seeing this gradation and diversity of structure in one small, intimately related group of birds, one might really fancy that from an original paucity of birds in this archipelago, meaning an original small number of birds in this group of islands, one species had been taken and modified for different ends. It was almost like these birds were the way they were because they came from a common ancestor. Huh. I have to think about that for a while. So the beagle left the Galapagos, crossed the Pacific, uh, visited Australia for a while. One of the things Darwin noticed was this very weird way in which Australian marsupials look like mimics of placental mammals from elsewhere. Uh, so for example, on the left, this looks like a flying squirrel uh, it's a small mammal with a bushy tail and webs of skin uh, joining its uh, ankles and wrists that enable it to glide from tree to tree. It looks a heck of a lot like a flying squirrel. It's not. It's a sugar glider. It's a marsupial. Um, it gives birth to underdeveloped young uh, that finish developing in pouches uh, like possums. Uh, over there on the right, that's commonly called a native cat. Uh, 
uh, because it's a kind of cat-like. It's nocturnal and it's a carnivore that hunts by night, uh, but it's not a cat at all. It's another marsupial. This one's called the qual. And you get marsupials in Australia that look like moles. They aren't. They reproduce in a completely different way, but they look mole-like. Uh, you get sugar gliders that look like flying squirrels. Uh, numbats have no teeth and great big claws and a long sticky tongue, uh, which they use to rip open ant nests and slurp up the ants or termites. Make a living in much the same way as South American anteaters, have some of the same adaptations as South American anteaters, but they're not South American anteaters, they're marsupials. And as Darwin would write in his diary, a disbeliever in everything beyond his own reason might exclaim, surely two distinct creators must have been at work. It's almost like there was one God who created mammals everywhere else and a different God who created Australia. And evidently the Australian God was cheating off of um, the everywhere else God's uh, blueprints. You know, if you, if you, you know, if you're judging this work, you definitely flag it for plagiarism here. You know, what is a marsupial doing looking like this anteater? You know, were you looking off of the other God's paper? Anyway, we'll actually talk again much, much later about why that happened as well, um, about why Australia got such unique mammals. So the beagle crosses the Indian Ocean. They explore some coral islands called atolls, uh, which are shaped like rings. Uh, that's an atoll as seen from a satellite. You have this ring of coral rock surrounding a shallow lagoon, while on the outside, the uh, ocean can drop down 20,000 feet. And Darwin came up with a very Lyellian theory for why you got ring-shaped coral islands in the tropics. Uh, they must have formed growing with the coral growing on the flanks of volcanoes. And then as the extinct volcanoes slowly sank down, coral reefs on their flanks slowly grew upwards, keeping a balance. And so you end up with a ring-shaped island. Uh, he would publish this in 1842. Um, his explanation was basically correct, but they didn't confirm it until the 1950s, uh, when the U.S. began using some of these coral atolls for atomic bomb tests. Uh, that was the first time anybody drilled really deeply into one of these islands, and they found out that the structure is basically right, that you'd start with a volcano in the middle what the heck? There's your volcano. There, there's smoke. And on the flanks of the volcano, all of this is coral. And coral tends to grow up. So if the volcano sinks down, the coral will grow upwards. And you end up with a ring-shaped island with a lagoon in the middle. And again, he turned out to be basically right about this. So the Beagle goes around Africa. They sail back up the Atlantic, stop off in Brazil one more time, and return to England on October 2nd, uh, 1836. Uh, Darwin went to live in London for a while, uh, but then purchased a house that at the time was in a little village. It's now been engulfed. It's now in London. It's maintained as a museum. It's called Down House. And Darwin lived here until he died in 1883. And uh, then his wife lived here until she died in 1896. And that's actually a pretty good place to pause. It's noon. I should keep going until 810, but I guess I'm feeling merciful. I'll try to make it up to you. Uh, tomorrow, uh, it's the, uh, uh, tomorrow it's the same drill. Oh, I need to stop recording.
and I'll stop recording now.